Hello and welcome to The Lion's Den and our demystifying AI podcast series. We're bridging the gap between overly complex AI chat and the more simplified understanding of us mere mortals. I'm sure that many of you understand bits and pieces in the world of AI, but perhaps lack a simple overarching view that pieces it all together. And importantly, you're looking to understand why and how AI could be essential in our respective worlds. We'll be here to hold your hand on that journey as we speak to key figures across a range of industries and functions. We'll explore their journey, insights, and practical applications of AI. From data scientists and engineers to business leaders, investors, and ethicists. We'll cover a wide range of perspectives, so let's get started. Okay, great. So it looks like we're off and running. So I have Sam Jane with me. Sam uh, is, uh, you know, has had a pretty, pretty inspiring career when it comes to data science and machine learning and progressively all things AI. And he's been right at the, the, the nexus of all of those things for over 20 years now. And we're, we're really excited to have you on, Sam, and to tell us a little bit about your perspectives on a range of different AI topics. And I think we'll talk about a, a number of things from your background, including some of the industries you've operated in and perhaps also some of the technologies at play within AI today that you have some interesting concepts and, and thoughts on. So welcome. Um, and I guess my first question, which is always what I ask most of my guests is, uh, you know, where have you come from? What's your background? Uh, so I graduated from Indian Institute of Technology, which is the top engineering college. In India, even leaders like Google's uh, CEO came from comes from there, and then I did a PhD in Michigan. I've been in AI for twenty years. Great, great. And so I'm guessing this is your passion as well, right? Data science and machine learning and AI and all those things. It sounds like you lived it. Yeah, of course. I mean, like I worked in a range of industries and really made a difference. I used it for creating one billion dollar in sales and enabling thirty one three thousand percent annualized profits. So really excited to share more. Okay, great. So. I often start a little bit broad. Excuse me for a moment, but you know, maybe you can just tell me very broadly how have how have you kind of used AI to really make a difference in in the companies you've worked in and, and the environment you've operated in? Uh, sure. I mean, I worked in a range of industries, anywhere from energy to manufacturing to capital markets, insurance. Um, I guess the biggest impact I made was in trading, uh, where I improved annualized win rate from thirty percent to seventy percent. Increase annualized profit from 30% to 3,000%. Uh, and also in a manufacturing company, uh, Daikin, where I enabled $1 billion in sales to continue. Okay, great. And so maybe, maybe let's just for a moment talk about capital markets because, you know, like there's a, there's a wealth of data when it comes to anything capital markets. So I'm guessing that that was why there was such a good fit for you know, data science and, and predominantly machine learning and then latterly AI to support success in those industries. Can you talk a little bit about, about your capital markets experience and deployment of AI there? Uh, sure, yes, there is a lot of data there for sure, but you see that alone is not sufficient to create great models. Mm -hmm. uh, there needs to be a domain expertise as well. And I've seen a lot of implementation of models, but they've not been successful because people didn't know what to use and how to use the data, how to extract features from this information. <laughs> Uh, but I started off uh, in the power trading markets, for example, very simply by understanding market dynamics. And you think of mm -hmm. a two-plus marketplace, regardless of capital markets or, or Uber, it's the same thing. You have buyers and sellers. If there's more mm -hmm. demand, price goes up. If there's less sellers, price goes up. Or the reverse. If there's less buyers, price will fall. Uh, so I used fundamentals in the power markets, say temperature or weather or, or population growth, to determine how the buying increase um, and then on the supply side i try to understand what where can we get power from say wind farms or solar farms or natural gas or other sources and then use machine learning models to create an equilibrium and say and this hour we like to see a power sp spike uh, and then that would be communicated to our traders and then recommended with the probability and then how much probably success we expect and how much capital we should deploy and that of course improved, made it very surgical precision in which hour to trade and how to trade it. Uh, so that really helped them become mm. better in trading. 
And 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 that's an interesting one with the kind of the weather data, climate data, that sort of stuff. Is there anything that you found out by doing that process that surprised you that you're like, oh, I didn't realize that actually the the pricing would change in that way as a result of that particular catalyst? I would say that in the power trading markets, uh, it's very hard to predict weather accurately. So we might get a general sense that we might have a cloudy weather. Um, in general, but if the solar farm we are particularly focused on, uh, the cloud cover misses it by 100 meters, that's a binary thing. Either you have cloud cover on the solar farm or you don't. So just having a general sense of weather is not good enough for us. It needs to be highly precise in location to tell us how much of a power generating capacity we would lose on that plant. So my understanding of granularity of weather change completely after according to power trading okay that's I, I think is one of those things as well where um i guess it depends where you get your weather data from as well because i'm imagining there's a lot of different sources and so you can feed those different sources into your model uh but ultimately you're going to get different results and as you say like it might be as binary as you know the, the cloud cover misses by you know 300 feet and therefore you've got a different result and and so I guess with that in mind, were you dealing with lots of different feeds and information and having to somehow bring those together within your model? And and if so, like how did you weight the the value of those different uh, inputs? Uh, that's an interesting question, um, and it's a dynamic answer. Actually, uh, we had to um, use a general voting scheme. In general, you could use that. Okay there's a consensus in weather conditions uh, or we could also use things like uh, recently we are seeing this um, data feed is being more accurate for this condition so it was both a general rating and also a more um, i would say recency biased rating in terms of which data we would give more weight for certain uh, parameters we're evaluating hmm. So I guess with, with that 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 type of work is more the more traditional data science data science models um, I guess as we think of it today. What, what about as we progress now into you know adding things like natural language processing and things like that? How does that influence some of the the uh, sectors you've operated in? Um, yeah, that's a very interesting question, and that was actually the reason why, as lucrative as trading is. Um, I wanted to incorporate an LP. So a few years ago, I made a shift in my career where I joined an insurance company uh, to not just build an automated underwriting platform, which of course uses classical machine learning, um, but also uh, we were able to create customer safety database, uh, which I leveraged to create a generic product for personalized marketing. Uh, so this is in the early, early days when we had GPT-3 and it's all been branded as chat GPT, uh, but still use it for personalized marketing where uh, we saw quite a dramatic difference in how customers are responding to it. And we are seeing uptick in email open rate by 2x, sponsored 4x, which led to revenue increase of 4x. So um, I was very excited to see how like a very nascent technology at that time could still make a big difference. Mm, okay. And so what, what do you think that technology was missing that we have today and would have made it ultimately a lot better if you, had, if you deployed it today? Um, so at that time, it was um, um, still early days. We didn't even know if it would work from a business standpoint. Um, there, I think there are two parts to your question. I mean, what is the technology missing and how can the business leverage it? Yeah. Uh, just because you may have a great technology or a substantially better technology doesn't mean that it is use usable by business as is. Right? And uh, so we're certainly seeing a lot of improvement in say, the foundational models. Uh, we're seeing, say, GPT 3.5, 4, and 4 old come out now, which is all great. But there are still a lot of gaps between how that can be productionized. Generative AI, by its very nature, has a known problem hallucination. And we know that Air Canada lost a lawsuit in February because the chatbot hallucinated a bereavement policy. Um, Google, which is one of the most respected tech companies, Gemini, their chatbot in February, also created toxic images of World War II soldiers. So today, people are using things like fine tuning and uh, rags or retrieval augmented generation to circumvent these issues, but there are still uh, production issues in bringing them to life, which I have addressed. 
Okay. So let's let's um back up a little bit to talk about some of these technologies. So I think for some of our listeners there, you know, may not be one hundred percent up to date on all these things. Uh, you know, you've talked about chat GPT models, which obviously allow large large language models which are being which are being used. And then I'm guessing that in the situations you've seen, you've been augmenting them with other data or proprietary data from the business or or maybe even other models actually running them side by side. So maybe you could talk about how those things fit together in the first instance, and then we can talk about probably things like the, the, the rags and things like that, and you can give a little bit of detail on that. Yeah, sure. Uh, so while we have a very strong, uh, say, foundation models, ChatGPT, Anthropic, or other models are there, they are not. They don't have access to any proprietary information that's in a company's database or in a company's literature. Um, so, for a customer of a company to get a useful answer, they don't need a general answer. They need an answer from this company. So things like uh, they would not. So, for example, say in an asset management firm, <clears throat> if you're a customer um, and you ask a question, "Hey, what are my 401k options?" you don't expect a general answer like you can invest in equities and bonds and money market funds, right? You expect a very specific answer in terms of <clears throat> the products this company offers um, for your 401k. And that information is not available to a foundational model. Uh, so you need an additional step after the foundational model to answer your specific question, right? Um, and there are two ways of doing it. One is fine tuning and one is rags. So we can talk about that in detail, but the idea basically is two-step, that you have a foundational model, and then you combine it with uh, proprietary data from a company, which is not shared with the foundational model company. It remains within the confines of the company itself, but still combining these two enables us to address issues like hallucinations. Yeah. So we'll talk about hallucinations in a second, but I think you've also touched on that important point around uh, the kind of proprietary nature of data and the fact that you don't, you know, everyone is scared of sharing their data in the wrong way, particularly if it's, you know, overlaid. I mean, if you look in Europe, if there's GDPR associated with it, obviously not so much in the US. But this is super important stuff, the, the safety of that data. So it's good for everyone to understand that there is a, there's there's models out there that actually process, analyze, and generate, but then those are augmented by proprietary data, which is not shared. And I know I'm just making the same point again, but I just think it's a really important one. You obviously mentioned those two things about you know, fine tuning um, and, and kind of, and, and basically you know, training and things like that as well. Can you maybe talk us through how that actually works in practice? So you're, a, you're an insurance company, let's say, and you, you're using ChatGPT 4.0, and you're then applying a whole load of underwriting data uh, about each of your um, individuals who um, have got um, a policy with you, and you're then suggesting to them what they should do in terms of their next policy or their next, you know, I don't know, the way in which they value their home or something. How, how does that actually work in practice when you bring those components together and fine-tune that model? Yeah, so there uh, are two ways of doing it. One is fine-tuning, which you asked. The other is also rags or retrieval augmented generation. So the way fine-tuning works is uh, we take a proprietary model and then we further train it with proprietary data which is within the confines of a company. Now, now this post-training model is not shared outside of the company's bounds. Um, and that sort of enables it to remain safe. The issue is that every time you update your basic data, you have a lag between when your model, when your data was updated versus when your model was updated. And training this over and over on GPUs can get costly. And so there's a bit of a trade-off here in terms of, uh, you can get really accurate answers, um, but if, as long as your data doesn't change, and if you're okay with a bit of a lag between your data being updated and your model answers, then that's, that's fine, and, you have, and you're okay with the cost part of it. Uh, but in terms of, uh, adopting the corporate language, the way corp, you know, a company speaks or communicates to its customers, this is probably the best or customized way of doing it. But there are sort of, uh, sort of cautions that, hey, you have to be uh, aware of the lag part of it and you have to be aware of the cost part of it of training. As long as they're acceptable, then that's okay. 
Mm. Yeah, the cost part comes up quite a lot in conversation. I think there's to the layperson, there's this panacea of of you know, Gen AI will do everything for me. But the reality is that even with the advent of you know GPUs with these kind of you know ability to do multiple parallel processes, the reality is that the cost of delivering on that is colossal for the simplest or what seems to be the simplest of tasks. I remember someone talking about from a customer service perspective that in theory you could have a extremely intelligent Gen AI assistant that does all of your sales calls for you as like an SDR, for, for example, and it could be really convincing. But the problem is that to do it at that level, the <laughs> cost of doing that versus the benefit of a slightly increased conversion rate is completely the wrong way around. And I think that's, and I'm sure that's the same in other industries. Have you come across that? Any other specific examples in, in the industries you've operated in? Yeah, I mean, that that actually is is a key consideration, right? I mean, unless you have sort of free or unlimited training power, you just, in my opinion, an ordinary company, it's not feasible. So <clears throat> the approach I suggest for an average company is that we want to fine-tune the model once to learn the corporate way of speaking or corporate language but not for information retrieval. And if your data is constantly changing, which it is, then you don't want to use this part for it. But for this part, you want to use something, a different part, which is known as RAGS or Retrieval Augmented Generation, which is a fraction of the cost of fine tuning if implemented correctly. So, so tell, to tell us about, because you mentioned it quite a number of times, retrieval automated generation or RAGS. For, for, for us lay people who aren't in depth in this stuff, what, what is that? How does it work? Um, so sort of like fine tuning, it's also a two-step process, right? Um, the first part is that you have a foundational model and then you ask a question, like in our case, it says that, for example, like what options do you have for your 401k, right? Or what options do I have for my insurance policy? That question is sort of parsed semantically and that information is retrieved in real time from the company's proprietary database or proprietary data sources. Uh, but then the foundation model comes in and then threads it together um, to answer your question. <clears throat> the challenge is how is the data that you have in your in your in the in the company proprietor that you have how is that being chunked how is it being broken up so that it can be picked up by the semantic search engine <clears throat> and that's when i start seeing some production level issues so the devil is in the details here every model that you talk about like machine learning ai or otherwise uh, the question is how do you measure success of a model Right in your, in your classical machine learning, like in trading, for example, you had issues like accuracy or F1 scores or true positive, false positive. Uh, but in Gen AI, uh, well, how do you, the answers that are going to be created in the future are different than what we have today. So the classical metrics don't work. When I have conversations with leaders of um, the top companies, even in America, and the answers I've received are things like, well, we let our users tell us, uh, thumbs up, thumbs down. Uh, and in my opinion, that's not a convincing approach because your users don't have to tell you an answer and B, uh, they don't have to give you a correct answer. And even if they give you correct answers, things that are going to be created in the future are brand new. So you have no metrics to measure the success. So that's a foundational part of it. Like how do you measure success of your models? And, 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 and how have you tried to do that? Because I mean, you, you must have tried. Uh, yes. So in my opinion, this approach is not a way to do it. The asking the user for feedback is not the way to do it. Uh, so I had to create quantitative metrics for measuring the success of every answer in real time. Um, so that's sort of my secret sauce of my success. I created those metrics. I share are the user answers being, is a, user, is, a, is a query being answered completely? Is a query being answered thoroughly? Um, are we using all the data? Uh, so that's part one. And the other part of it is in production, I'm also seeing very superficial level information being answered for things like, uh, well, where does Rupert live? I mean, that question can be answered by a search on your LinkedIn or your Facebook or Instagram and say, hey, city search and find Rupert City and you can answer it. To your point earlier, does it have value? Yes, but it's like using a sledgehammer to you know, 
hit a nail. The real power comes in asking deeper questions like, hey, what's the best selling dish uh, in the best restaurant within five miles of where Rupert lives? Now that information is not on your Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, anywhere. It's not in any one particular place either. We really have to go through multiple sources of data to get it. Similarly, in a company, companies care about deeper information, telling them things like, uh, how many customers do we have? Sure, something. But what they really care about is, which customer are we at risk of losing in the next three months and how we should intervene? Right? And that information requires a completely different architecture than what is being used in the marketplace today. Well, that's an interesting one because I think that's, there's a generative element to that, right? Because actually it's there's some future prediction about what it is that's going to make that customer happy or sad in the future or, or rather stay or go in the future. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's that part, but I think it's also the part on how we get to that information, right? How do you answer which customer is it? And yeah. The searches that are being done today are, for the most part, very superficial, like text only. They don't really even dig into a company's database. They don't really even dig into a document which has text and tables. So my point is that we can't, the, search, the, the architects that are being constructed today, for the most part, don't even get to that answer. And that, in, in my opinion, is a major gap in how things are being constructed today from a basic architecture standpoint. Uh, which I had to do. That's the first part of it. The second part of it is, it's a, so the first part of it, like the quality of the answer, right? The second part of it is how fast you get there. I think of typing a query in Google and you get a response in 10 seconds. I mean, do you think it'll be an acceptable speed? Like probably not. I mean, you, everyone's used to getting answers in microseconds, a second at best. So that's the latency part of it, and that comes again to the cost part of it. How are you architecting your thing so that the user experience is, is good, is acceptable, uh, and the way things are being architected today, in my opinion, will not have low latency. But, but I assume with the, with the architecture point, if you get the architecture right, you can actually deal with both those issues. You can, number one, provide better answers, and number two, do it in a way that's much quicker and more effective, right? So you can... You can deal with the cost of processing power and you can also deal with the, I guess, the negative cost of not giving an answer, you know, in, in good time that's good enough quality. Uh, yes, yes, we're right. I mean, if the right architecture is deployed, but people aren't doing it. Um... So why aren't people doing it then? I mean, that's, that's always the question, right? So, so, so no, it's, it, it's a bold statement. It's probably true. I'm sure it is. But, but, but why aren't they? And, and is there something that's prohibiting them? Is it because there's a legacy, you know, a legacy stack of code and models that they have to use and they're just building on and building on and building on and no one wants to start from scratch? Or, or is there something else? Uh, I obviously don't have an insight into what everyone is doing. This is, of course, my public understanding of material that I can come across and the conversations I've had. So I can't conclusively answer your question. My suspicion is the things you mentioned, the architecture that they have is probably legacy or the vendors they're using are legacy. Uh, and they are not thinking in terms of um, relationships um, across multiple domains. Even today, people think of a solution for marketing, people for sales or for underwriting, but I think in terms of enterprise level, how are we threading information across the entire company? Rarely do I come across uh, leaders who are discussing at enterprise level, how we're creating models that are, that are processing data across enterprise. I would guess your an um, answer to your question is, um, A, it's a legacy architecture that they're using or they have used and they continue to use it. And B, I think they're still thinking in silo terms. Yeah, I mean, I think it's also the nature of, of relatively new technologies in that they start off relatively fragmented. And that's because very few businesses or companies are large enough and have enough resources, enough money to kind of do a, a very large scale addressing of the new technology. So what happens is you have, you know, someone who's left Google, who's done some AI stuff there, will start up a, an AI startup that's highly focused on a specific slither of the market. And I think over the time, what happens is, and we've already seen this, let's face it, those businesses, if they come to fruition and, and actually have a good product, 
get bought up and get subsumed into the larger organizations dealing with AI. And then you get a consolidation in the market. I think we're still at that phase of just a highly, highly fragmented fragmented industry. And it's not to say it's a bad thing, right? Because because you need all that innovation and in pockets everywhere. But I, but I would guess that's why we don't have a systematized way of of, of rebuilding and restructuring that architecture. And maybe it just needs all of the, the raw materials to be in place first, which bubbles up through that process of fragmentation to consolidation. Does that, does that kind of resonate as well? Um, sure, I think that's a fair point. I think um, you're, you're right. And we'll see how the market matures. There's still, there's still very, very early days in the Gen AI space. Um, I was also thinking in terms of how is a company storing its data itself? So it's not necessarily a solution architecture sort of perspective, but internally, how is the company storing or accessing its data? Um, how is it deriving relationships between the different aspects? So I've seen or heard stories where a CEO asks a question about, hey, tell me about this customer, and he or she gets six answers because the marketing team has one answer, sales another answer, finance another answer. So, and you really want one answer or one representation of a customer. And I think it's that piece as well. Okay. Okay. Now that makes sense. So, so look, let's change tack for a moment. You mentioned before hallucinations, and I do love hallucinations because it's quite entertaining. So, I guess I have two questions on this one. The first one is, you know, have you got some good stories apart from some of the obvious ones that we know about from 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 Gemini and things like that? Uh, and the second question is, how, how can we reduce hallucinations? Or I wonder whether those, whether those hallucinations become fulfilling the same function as dreaming does for humans, which is actually, it's a beneficial thing to kind of help to kind of iterate the brain processes and memory and all those things. Um, I think if you're using it for internal corporate humor, then yes. <laughs> but I think in general, when we are answering customer questions, we really need to be uh, very, very careful. And it's better to be safe than sorry. <laughs> Our sense of humor might not be appreciated by everybody else. So I think uh, Air Canada is certainly a caution tell. Then you really don't want to be telling your customer that, hey, you can have a free ticket, you know? <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's true, right? And I think I, it's, it's, it's funny you bring that up, actually, because obviously one of the things that Gen AI, Gen AI is able to do but is still limited is to really, truly understand emotions and intent. And, you know, I think I saw something the other day where you can take one sentence oh. with 10 words. And if you put the emphasis on a different word, the first word, the second word, third word, across all those 10 words, every sentence means a different thing. Um, and, I, and, and I don't, do you think we'll ever be able to deal with that? Do you think Gen AI will ever be able to overcome that level of complexity? Um, I think they're already seeing it. Um, I mean, we are, I think we're already seeing it in GPT-4.0. Uh, the Omni model model we just got released. So uh, I have not played with it myself, but I've read reports that it is very capable of uh, not just uh, reading or uh, analyzing emotions, but also responding in a humorous fashion. So we're already seeing that come come out. Uh, of course, I, it's still to be tested and in a corporate environment, how it works. But I think it, the yeah, technology is certainly um, progressing to that point. But, but there's a bit of a difference. I mean, there's a bit of a, I would say, um, difference here. Like in the base technology advancing to that point where it can do all the things you mentioned. And from a business standpoint, how do we leverage it in a safe, legal way? So I think we'll see a bit of a lag here in terms of, can the basic technology do it, but how do we use it? Yeah, and it's interesting, right, that you see you see the two sides of the coin in Europe and the US, for example. So in Europe, you've got, you know, this bill that, that, that says, you know, you can and can't use AI like this. And half of it is predicated on something you don't even know how AI is actually going to evolve. On the flip side, you've got the US where, okay, admittedly, there are some things, you know, in the motion at the moment, but but ultimately there isn't something today. And in that situation, it's great for innovation within AI, but it opens up to all sorts of ethical and sort of data-led issues. And I guess we'll end up with some kind of happy medium. Who knows? But let's see. Let's see. And I just want to go back to that humor point for a moment. So you talked about chatbots earlier, and you, and you obviously developed and, and launched a chatbot um, you know, a few years ago. 
technology is completely changed in Gen I now. If you had to launch a chatbot today, what do you what do you think would be the core things that you would change or add or iterate about those earlier chatbots? Uh, what I would change um, things like um, having a much deeper, richer architecture, which can dig into a uh, much deeper level of insights um, of a customer, which are spread across multiple data sources. So that's both an architectural design issue and also the vendor selection issue um, is being very cost conscious. Just because we have GPT 4.0 or the latest foundational model doesn't necessarily mean it is best for our purposes. That comes to the cost point of it. Uh, and what model is good enough? What cost are we paying for the computation? And what is the ROI? So I have a very clear focus there. Uh, and that's sort of a, I would say it's a continuous process because every day you see more improvements, but the cost is coming down as well in some cases, or cost is changing, I would say. So we have to continuously um, keep abreast and check um, on on that front. But that would be sort of my, uh, and, and the third piece of it is being very, very aware of my metrics. Like I don't want to diminish that part. That is a very, very important part of it is how are my metrics changing uh, in terms of completeness, thoroughness of the answers to ensure that, you know, yeah. we, we answer the customer's question, we satisfy the customer, but also don't get to any e either ethical or legal issue. Uh, just because it's not a law doesn't mean, you know, you still have to be very cautious on the legal, on the ethics side of it. Yeah, I think we do. I think there's there's a lot of stuff outside of what the technology can do, and it's more about how it can be used and how it can be, you know, carefully watched and considered within the community as a whole and the global community and ethics and all those sorts of things. So, um, look, I think it's it's look. There's obviously a bright future ahead. You're obviously heavy embedded in it. Um, it's been really, it's been fantastic chatting with you, Sam. I think it's, you know, there's some certainly some things to think about deeply. I'm I'm very curious now. I'm going to be thinking a lot about this architecture point because I'd love to see whether the you know the larger organizations start talking about their models in that way that they've actually got to a point when they need to re-engineer that architecture or or think about how they work for proprietary data. So super interesting. So look, thank you so much for joining us again. It's been fabulous speaking to you. Um, and uh, we look forward to hearing more from you in the future. But, thank uh, you very much. But for now, it's uh, thank you very much and uh, appreciate your time, Sam. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.